Good afternoon, everyone. So I've had the opportunity to study biochemistry and organic chemistry, to work for over 12 years in uh, pharmaceutical research, and now to have been teaching here at this college for about 10 years these same subjects. And I've also completed an undergraduate degree in science education. So as you can probably see, I'm passionate about science. And so scientific inquiry is about critical thinking. And so the goal here is going to be able to examine another perspective, which is sometimes either missing or misrepresented. And so that's essentially what we're going to be doing today. And from this, I'm going to start from a quote from an old textbook of mine in biochemistry. And it starts this way. Some 20 billion years ago, the universe arose with an explosion. Every atom was born in the Big Bang. As this presents itself as an explanation for the origin of the universe, it still exists as a mystery. And it continues by saying that ultimately, living things are composed of lifeless molecules that conform to all of the physical and chemical laws. But here's the question. If lifeless molecules obey all of these material laws, how is it that spontaneously, as a function of time, these can have come together to form living organisms? And so that's the question of the mystery of the origin of life. And finally, yet living organisms possess extraordinary attributes not shown by collections of inanimate molecules. If living organisms are only made of inanimate molecules, from where do these extraordinary attributes come from? And this is more than just looking at the cell or at higher organism, but this essentially looking at the reality of consciousness or the mind, the mystery of that. So here we have it, the mystery of the origin of the universe, of life within the universe, and of consciousness within life. So uh, ultimately, I would like to bring two more um, common sayings that we tend to hear in scientific circles. The first is that everything in the universe is matter and energy. And while it's true that we're able to explain so much just by relying on matter and energy, the reality is that it's a bit of a stretch to explain everything simply using this reality. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later on. The other aspect is that though the event that the probability for an event to occur in the physical universe is extremely low, for example, the things that we've just been talking about, that the availability of a great amount of time essentially makes this possible. But we have to be careful, because essentially we know that time only allows what is possible. Time does not allow what, what is impossible. So the real question behind this is how do we know what is possible and what is not possible? And ultimately that requires going back to the fundamentals, and that represents thermodynamics, the principles that ultimately govern matter and energy in this physical universe. And so that points to the um, fundamental laws. The first one, which is essentially connected to the concept of causality. That everything that happens in the universe happens for a reason, cause and effect. And that ultimately leads to the principle of conservation. That nothing is created or destroyed. That everything is transferred, transferred or transformed. And how ultimately this in itself brings a lot of interesting questions about what we're dealing with right now. But that paints a picture that is very static of our universe. And yet we know that things are happening around us all the time. So what's the explanation for this? Well, enter the second law of thermodynamics. And how ultimately this is connected to the reality of what we call Gibbs free energy. That there's a certain amount of energy in the universe that is available to allow all the things that happen around us to take place. And how ultimately the question is, what is the driving force for this energy to be spent and to do all the things that we observe? And that's the second law of entropy. And how ultimately for anything to occur in this physical universe, the disorder of the universe must increase. And so what do these things all tell us about the reality of the challenging questions that we are facing? Well, first of all, concerning the universe, we see that everything is moving towards low Gibbs energy and high disorder. So if you extrapolate back into time, that leads to a position where you have maximum energy and minimum disorder, hence the theory of the Big Bang. But that again still begs a question. Where does that quantum dot ultimately come from and what caused it, it to explode? So as we can see, this points to a mystery. 
Sometimes people will speak of a singularity. You see this in scientific literature. Well, what is a singularity? A singularity is defined as a physical phenomenon that occurs in the physical universe for which we have no physical explanation. So it's a mystery un under the guise of another term. And so what does this tell us concerning the reality of life that we see in this universe? Well, in order for life to emerge with its high energy structures and low disorder, that ultimately has to emerge from what we observe in some sort of primordial pool. And so as you can observe from these graphs, things need to go in the opposite direction from which things typically go. And as scientists will readily observe, there is nothing in the known laws that compels matter to organize into life. And so the mystery, again, still remains. However, we do see on Earth all the time structures that do have higher Gibbs energy and less, or less disorder. So the question is, well, how is this possible? Well, the Earth is not a closed system. It is an open system that receives all of this energy from the sun that is outside of the Earth. But we need to be careful, because as far as we know, energy on its own will not lead to high energy, low disorder structures. That this is only possible on life because of what we observe in technological and biological systems, which is the complex engineering that allows us, that allows the system ultimately to build these structures. But even beyond the complexity of all of these structures and mechanism is another reality that is even more important and profound. If I take a computer and I pass over the computer a magnet over the hard drive, you and I know that in terms of matter and energy, nothing has changed, and yet something is missing. But if it's not matter and energy, what is missing? And that ultimately is what we call information. And so what is information? Well, information is neither matter nor is it energy. Information is the organization of matter using energy. But the issue is, is that all of the laws that we understand from the universe will not spontaneously organize information, but will spontaneously disorganize it. And so again, the mystery continues. And even beyond this, as we examine the reality of what information is all about, it requires these three coexisting realities that must be present in order for it to exist. You need to have a receiver, and you need to have a transmitter and a code that is going to be shared between the two. And so the question once again is, how can all of this begin? In life, DNA exists as the repository of all information. A code that is spelled out with four chemical letters, stitched together into words that are called codons. And all these align together in order to give us a sentence or a gene. And all these genes put together, which ultimately make the book of life. And so the question is, where does all of this information come from? Can a book essentially write itself? So as you can see, these are indeed greatly challenging discussions. Let's examine life now at the level of the single cell. And so in each and every one of our cells is more than 3 billion bits of information, which had to be faithfully copied tens of trillions of time in order to make an organism like this. And how does that work at the molecular level? So essentially, DNA replication involves all of this sophisticated machinery that is going to unroll, uncoil, and essentially replicate all of this information into two identical double-stranded DNA to be passed down to the other cells. And there's even a quality control mechanism that is going to verify the work that is being done and correct mistakes that have been made. So how is all of this information expressed? Well, ultimately, this happens at the level of transcription, where a gene needs to be located and then faithfully copied in order for that RNA piece of information to leave the nucleus of the cell and to ultimately make its way to the cell. To the cell. There we go. Where it is ultimately going to be read and translated code by code, letter by letter, ultimately into a protein, stitching all of these amino acids together. So again, if life just appeared on its own in the beginning, the question is, what could be the precursor? Well, the challenge is that proteins ultimately come from RNA. 
And it requires sophisticated machinery in, er in order to generate these proteins. Furthermore, RNA comes from DNA, again requiring complex enzymes for these to be constructed. And finally, DNA also, in order to be built, requires a whole slew of different types of proteins and enzymes in order for it to be built. And the question lingers on, where does the information inside the DNA come from? So ultimately, this paints a vicious cycle that is of great challenge. And how ultimately, we are not just cells. And higher levels of complexity require higher levels of organization, which I'm going to split into six parts. So ultimately, the brain exists in the body as the repository of information, which is involving a two-way communication system with the rest of the body via electrical and chemical means. This system must be in place and functional in order for life to be viable. And all of this information ultimately is expressed through a variety of different structures. Some are static, some are connective, and some are dynamic. And again, all of these need to be in place and functional in order for life to be viable. Well, we are not independent. Just like the cell that needs to, co to consume in order to survive, the body needs to obtain from the environment all kinds of nutrient in order for life to be possible. And the higher levels of complexity of the organism, once again, means that all of these structures and mechanisms must be in place in order for life to be possible. And as things ultimately come in, they must also come out. And ultimately, we have, once again, highly specialized structures inside the body that are going to remove the waste, collect it, and then temporarily discharge it. And failure of these mechanisms will lead to toxins increasing in the blood and rapidly leading to organ failure. And finally, we also have the necessity for preservation. Just as the cell is able to fix and repair itself, the body is able to do just that. But even more so, it must be able to identify within itself all of these pathogens that need to be removed in order for life to be viable. And last, but definitely not least, I think everyone here knows that we're not going to start splitting somewhere in the middle and eventually lead to two organisms, but that, again, higher levels of complexity require higher levels of organization. And that sexual reproduction, more, much more complex and interesting, also involves multiple different aspects of great challenge. Number one, the process of meiosis that is going to happen in sex cells of both the man and of the woman, but also that the female body is going to have all of the structures and mechanisms for the baby to be able to grow, to then be delivered, and then to have the ability to nourish that baby once it is born. And that's not the end of the story. Even that baby, once it is born, needs to have all of the instincts in order for it to be able to survive. So whatever we look at the level of the cell and the vicious cycle and the complex difficulties that exist there, even more so do we discover the same reality when we look at higher organisms. I mean, think about it. How can man and woman arrive on the scene without man and woman first being there? The challenge is very substantial. And so ultimately, as we examine life, it is an association of interdependent, complex systems at every single level. Whether it's at the level of the cell, of the tissue, of the organ, of the system, all of these things must be in place and functional in order for the organism to be viable. And that's not still the end, because we are also dependent on other organisms unlike ourselves. All of us dependent on a variety of biotic and abiotic factors that are necessary within the ecosystem for life to be possible. And all of that is also dependent on the autotrophs, the plants that are essentially going to capture the light, the energy that comes from beyond the earth in order to provide all of the energy and the structures that are necessary for life. So this paints indeed quite a complex picture. Now I'd like to finish this talk by looking at the very last level, which is essentially how in man, and this is Isaac Asimov's quote, in man is a three-pound brain which is the most complex and orderly arrangement of matter in the universe. But the question is, can all of this complexity and order explain our human reality, our ability to think, our ability to feel, our ability to make decisions? This is a well-recognized challenge. And as I uh, show here, Nichols and Newsom, who are basically saying in nature, 
in the scientific uh, journal, if our mental lives are determined by the molecular and cellular events, what are we to make of our experience of freedom? We have no solution to this problem. The reality is, if I take a rock and I throw it into the air, it has no ability to think about what it's going to do. It has no emotion and it has no choice. It obeys the laws to which it is submitted. And so if we are only atoms and molecules put together, then the question continues as to where all of these abilities that we think that we have, where do they come from? Our ability to think, to feel, and to make decisions. And I could put it to you this way. Is it my brain that is giving this presentation today? Or is it my brain that is allowing me to give this presentation today? These are two different statements. And the question is, which one of the two is the correct one, if any at all? So I would like to close essentially by quoting three great scientists who have examined these three great questions. Everyone, Einstein says, who is seriously engaged in the pursuit of science becomes convinced that the laws of nature manifest the existence of a spirit vastly superior to that of men. Einstein's point is that as you study the physical universe, you understand more and more about the structure and the reactions of matter and energy. And yet at the same time, all of this information does not provide an explanation as to where all of these things come from. And according to him, points even more to some sort of reality be be beyond time, space and matter to explain the reality that we observe. And now I quote, Darwin, who at the end of his book says that all organic beings have descended from some one primordial form into which life was first breeded, according to what we know of the laws impressed on matter by the Creator. His point, once again, is that as we understand biology, we are able to explain a lot of the variation and adaptation that is all around us, but that all of this information in itself is not enough to explain what we understand from life. And finally, this is Sir John Eccles, winner of a Nobel Prize on the research on the brain, who says, since material solutions fail to account for our uniqueness, I am constrained to attribute the uniqueness of the self to a supernatural creation. Again, the point is, who we are is indeed dependent on the organ that is the brain. But can we reduce the reality of who we are simply by synapses and neurons firing inside the brain? So in summary, it doesn't matter if we're on one side of the debate or the other. The point is that all of us are facing great mysteries. And so some people are trying to find the explanation just by looking inside the universe and then are faced with all of the challenges that were mentioned today. Some are trying to find explanations beyond this universe, but again are at a loss to explain how anything be be beyond time, space, and matter can exist. So in summary, since we all face these difficulties, and given the importance of these questions and the challenges that we face, I think it's high time that we encourage a meaningful and productive conversation between the two perspectives as we continue to ponder these questions of ultimate origins. Thank you.